Today I have a couple of book recommendations. One is an old friend we've talked about before. The other is brand new, and both are exceptional. Stay tuned to learn more. Hello, friends. Pastor Tim Westermeyer here, senior pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Good to be with you as always. I have a couple of books on my mind today. We've talked about books a lot over the last two or three years. One of the books I have on my mind is um, a result of the time we find ourselves in related to the church here. The other one is a book that I uh, just recently purchased. So I want to say a word about each of them. The first one related to the time of year we find ourselves in um, is Dorothy Sayers masterpiece The Man Born to be King I know I have lifted this up before but I don't apologize for lifting it up again um, as I maybe have said in the past C.S. Lewis himself one of the giants of um, Christian apologists and, and writers and authors in the last millennia read this book uh, every Lent he said uh, reread it every Lent and we are of course in the season of Lent but we're about to approach uh, this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday or Palm slash Passion Sunday. Um, when we turn our attention towards Holy Week and the events of Holy Week, which in, include Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then ultimately uh, concluding with a great celebration of Easter. And the man born to be king is, in fact, Dorothy Sayers retelling um, in 12 short plays the life um, story of Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm reminded, and she wrote this in the middle of the 20th century. It was written as a series of radio plays, which is a little hard for us to get our heads around. Um, but it reminds me more contemporarily, contemporaneously of the show called The Chosen, which maybe some of you have seen, starring Jonathan Rumi as Jesus. My wife and I have just watched the first few episodes of that. So we're a little late to that game, but I have found it to be a really wonderful um, visual. You know, this is now a, a series on, I can't remember what platform it's on. I guess we're watching it on YouTube, but it, it's not simply audio as Dorothy Sayers was, it's visual. And uh, my sense is he, uh, he and the people who are producing that are getting some of the same or have gotten some of the same negative feedback from uh, that Dorothy Sayers got back when she produced The Man Born to Be King which I would summarize as people being um, uncomfortable with seeing Jesus uh, as a human being. I mean, there's this sense that, you know, there should be um, images of Jesus in which he's basically a cardboard cutout coming out on stage and then speaking in a way that only God would speak. And as I've talked about before, that sort of does not do justice to the biblical narrative, which clearly Jesus was an incredible speaker, someone who captivated audiences with his stories. His stories are still the most powerful short stories, I would say, in the English language and, in fact, in the world in some ways. And that wouldn't have been possible if he wasn't both uh, what we as Christians confess, fully human and fully divine. And so the challenge when you portray Jesus is precisely to strike that balance and make him uh, believable as a human being, but also recognize the sort of mystery of something about him that makes him also different than, than us as a as a as uh, the son of God. I actually was just chatting about this with a member of church here this morning. So uh, all a long way of saying I, I commend to you the man born to be king. Uh, I commend to you the, the, uh, the chosen series. Again, I haven't seen it all the way to the end yet, but I've really enjoyed what I've seen. The other book I want to lift up for you is, I believe this is actually a very recently published book. Let me just confirm that. Yeah, uh, published this year in 2023. It's called Medieval Horizons, uh, Why the Middle Ages Matter by a gentleman named Ian Mortimer, who's a British historian. Um, I don't know uh, Ian Mortimer. Um, I, I've seen some of the other works he's published. Uh, this is the first piece I've read, but uh, here again, I'm going to actually <laughs> refer back to C.S. Lewis because this book, I'm not done with it yet, but lifts up the same theme that Lewis brings up in other places, namely chronological snobbery. Mortimer doesn't bring it up explicitly, but it's implied in what he's saying. And that idea, again, is that we, because we live 
now in 2023, assume that everyone who came before us was not as smart or sophisticated or intelligent or wise or wonderful as we are, which on the face of it is ridiculous. As many people have said, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and the achievements which we celebrate and take for granted today are a result of the many, many wonderful, incredible geniuses who've gone before us, many of whom lived in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages famously, uh, historians know this, the general public is less aware of it, were not the so-called Dark Ages. They were rich with all kinds of innovation and development, but because in our culture we have come to worship only technological development, some of those developments we are blind to. And let me just read a couple of things from Mortimer here to make the point. Um, This is in an early chapter called Horizons, and he says, If we only ever regard benchmarks of change in terms of technological innovations, it is like looking at the world through a red lens and declaring that everything is red. You don't notice the blue or the green. In our case, the lens is technology colored and it shows us vividly how technology has affected our lives since the 18th century. At the same time, it conceals other important changes such as urbanization, epidemic diseases, women's and workers' rights, and it completely obscures almost everything that happened in earlier centuries. And then he says this, technology did not bring about the French Revolution, which was arguably the most important event of modern times. It did not bring about the Renaissance or the Black Death or the fall of the Roman Empire. In short, if you want to understand the social change or social change before 1750, technological innovation is the wrong tool for the job. And then he says, just a page later, if you think medieval is synonymous with backwardness, then you are exposing your own ignorance. For this was the age that gave us universities, parliament, and some of the finest architecture to be found in Europe. So uh, this is a a passion of mine, I suppose, because um, in the same way that people culturally assume that people in the Middle Ages were backwards or not particularly sophisticated. I do think culturally people look at Christians in the same way. And I think, big surprise, that that is a wrong view of the world. And so uh, having the opportunity to read books like this, which reframe our understanding and give us a different perspective, I think is really important, which of course, um, sort of is a foretaste of what we will talk about in the coming weeks, again, during Holy Week and ultimately at Easter, uh, the point of which, the true story of Easter of which is to reframe our understanding of reality itself uh, as beloved children of a God who has, in fact, conquered for once, once and for all death itself. And we'll talk more about that, obviously, in the weeks ahead. But for now, I think that's it again. Check out both these books if you're interested. Also, I would love your thoughts about what you are reading or what you have found meaningful. Others who are watching this would appreciate that as well, I am sure. Thanks, as always, for your time. Be well, stay in touch, and God bless. Mm -hmm.